Um, first thing I just want to flag up, we are recording this afternoon's briefing. Um, we want to make this available to other businesses who weren't available to attend as well. So please bear that in mind um, through the afternoon. If you, if you ask questions, then, then you are being recorded. Can I ask everyone to turn off their cameras and microphones, please? That will just help us to, to manage the, the meeting. Um, we still got people joining us, so I'll just ask uh, Borough Council colleagues who, who are able to manage the lobby just to uh, let people in as as they come, please. That, that would help me greatly. Uh, first off, I should introduce myself. My name is, is Matthew, uh, Matthew Deves. I'm communications manager for Rugby Borough Council. Um, you get me in the hot seat today because we're in the pre-election PERDA period. Uh, this is the, the time between when an election is called and when an election takes place. And what that effectively means is that the leader of the council and the portfolio holder for growth and investment are not allowed to, to uh, take part in this session today or, or they would have wanted to have done that. So uh, I'm, I'm hosting you today. In practice, all that really means is I get in, to introduce all the experts who will be speaking to you um, a little bit later. So the way we're going to work this, um, I'll show you the agenda in a minute, but just because of the numbers um, here, I think I'd, I'd like to invite, if you've got any questions that come to mind during uh, any of the, the presentations, please drop them in the chat. Uh, at, the, at the top of your screen, there should be a, a, um, a chat icon that you can click on that says show conversation, and you can type in your question in there. Um, and I'll be able to pick those up and either answer as we go or, or keep them to the end. Um, and then after the presentations, and I should let you know the presentations are not going to be particularly long, we have a, a panel who will be able to answer questions. And during that time, I'll invite you to, to use the raise hand function, which is also at the top of the screen. And I'll invite you to, to speak and unmute your microphones and, and ask whatever question that you have. So um, that said, I think uh, we ought to make a start, what you're all here for. Um, so this is uh, our agenda for today. I'm going to give you a brief overview of where we are now with COVID-19 and the pandemic, just for context. I know you're not primarily here for that, but I think it is useful just to, to, to give us a bit of a steer on where we might be going with the roadmap. I'll then hand over to, to Henry, um, who, who some of you may have met, um, to, to talk you through the roadmap to reopening and some of the steps that you can be taking to plan for that now. I'll introduce uh, John Bass, who's going to just uh, introduce his organisation, the Coventry and Warwickshire Growth Hub, uh, on business support grants and loans. And then we've got the, the Q&A, where really anything that we haven't already spoken about, you're going to be able to 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 um to raise um to, so that that's the plan for this afternoon i mean it's, it's in diaries for two hours i'd be very surprised if we're, if we're anything like that but that's our commitment to you if you want to spend that long ans asking us questions that's how long we've got um we do understand you might want to, to leave us well before then um, I should start actually just before i go into the where are we now a a thank you to all all businesses um, for the respect that you've had for the restrictions um, and by respect I don't necessarily mean agreement but, but the way that you have complied with and respected the, the requirement to stick to the restrictions and the way that um, you've worked with uh, our teams who've uh, either been on the enforcement side or, or helping out um, I think without exception, um, we've had a, a cooperative and constructive dialogue with, with businesses and that's um, entirely down to your commitment and respect. So thank you very much for that. Um, and I won't say anything about the grand reopening. Um, and well, I said I wouldn't say anything about it, so I won't. Thank you. So very briefly then, um, the COVID situation where we are now, 
that's me, forgot to put that in. I hope you can, can see this uh, OK on your screens. What we have here uh, is from, from the left of the graph. Um, far left is March 2020, far right is where we are today. And what you've got there um, are the number of positive cases of COVID-19 in the borough of Rugby over that period of time. Just a, a word of caution here is that testing only really ramped up in June. So that initial spike there that you see around May 2020 would probably have been a, a lot higher if we'd been testing as extensively as we are now. Uh, you can see the big increase from September um, through to end of the second lockdown, uh, then a big spike over Christmas and only just now going back down again. Just really wanted to draw your attention here um, to a little uptick of a far right verb um, visible on the green line, which is our seven day average. I just want to draw your attention to the fact that although cases um, had dropped down to, to the levels that we last saw in September, we are now starting to see a little bit of an increase. Uh, this shows us uh, positivity um, by district and borough. Unfortunately, I couldn't filter this only to show rugby, but the one we're interested in is the green line um, over the same period of time. Positivity is um, of the total number of tests being taken, what proportion of them are testing positive? And if we look at the green line, um, we, we see a um, big increase in the proportion in January, which coincides with that big um, increase in the numbers of cases, uh, a drop down to, to just over 3%, which is pretty good, but then um, different to the rest of the county, that green line ticks up at the end. And that's what I just wanted to raise that there. So again, um, not only are we seeing more cases, but, uh, but a higher proportion of cases testing positive just over the last week or 10 days. Um, if I can bring my next one. Um, what we have here is the number of tests um, being taken. Uh, this is lateral flow tests. So this, this cuts out actually all the, the main ones down at, for, for people with symptoms. These are for people who do not have symptoms. Um, and what we see here is they started in, in rugby in earnest in the new year. We've been doing sort of the same numbers all the way through to the beginning of March. And then a big increase in the number of tests. And that equates to uh, the time at which we started testing schools. Um, and all this is coming together a little bit of a narrative I'm going to, to tell you about in just a moment. What this um, slide shows us is the age of the people who are testing positive. Um, the, the top line is, is over the 12 months, and the, the bottom one is um, in the last three months. And what we can see here is that since um, the big spike in from December, January onwards, the, the numbers of cases have consistently been higher amongst um, working age um, residents. Um, but in the last three weeks, we've seen that shift to a, a, the highest number of cases in the age group 10 to 19. What this is finding is that um, the increase in cases locally is linked with testing of school high school students who do not have, have symptoms. So um, that uptick is of concern, um, but we've only picked it up because of the increased testing. And what we hope what we can do from catching these cases whilst people don't have symptoms is that we can reduce the spread of those cases and ultimately we will see a lower number of cases overall. We just need to bear in mind that at the moment, the number of cases uh, in rugby uh, on a per 100,000 basis. Today's figures, 95 and a half per 100,000 in the last seven days of complete data. That's about 
double the national average for England. So um, the picture is, is generally encouraging, if not as encouraging as we would have liked. But set against that, most of the rest of the country is doing better. Um, I think I need to level with you about where the cases are. On the other hand, as Henry will, 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 will let you know in just a moment's time, um, this doesn't necessarily make any difference to where we are on the roadmap, but there we go. So that's the situation as things are now. Um, we know that testing is going to be something that features heavily in the government strategy and, and locally we, we will support that. Um, we know that local testing stations uh, contracts are in place and in some cases up to the end of the year. So it's around for a while and um, we need to, to make the most of that opportunity to, to control the virus. I think that's enough from me setting the scene. Um, so I want to introduce you to, to Henry Biddington. Um, he's our Principal Environmental Health Officer. Um, I hope many of you have, have dealt with Henry already. Um, if, if not, if you think you need your help, do get in touch with him help you out. And Henry, you're going to talk through the roadmap. Thank you, Matthew, and uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. It's great to see so many people on this webinar. Uh, we really appreciate you coming along and listening to, to us, uh, and hopefully you'll get something out of the, the webinar. Um, and as I say, if any questions, please just ask us and we'll, we'll help happily try and assist. OK, so uh, my overview is going to be on the roadmap to recovery set out by the government um, on the February 22nd. Uh, this is the government's sort of roadmap and, and key dates where we can look at trying to, to, to get businesses reopening to getting back to, to some sort of normality in a, a sort of controlled and, and safe manner, I guess. So that's what we're here to, to help you do. Um, so the, the first thing that the government are going to look at, that we've been advised, is that they're going to be looking at, at the data um, around you know, how they can ease restrictions uh, and before they go into any of the, the steps they're going to be looking at the four tests so apologies if you already sort of know all of this and, and, and quite understand it some of this um, you know, is quite widely out there but I think it's worth just considering um, before we, we sort of go into a, a wider, wider conversation about what, what the ins and outs of what you can and can't do. So the, the four tests are that the government have set to, to be looking at and the assessment will based on will be the, the, the vaccine deployment program continuing successfully, uh, evidence showing vaccines are sufficiently effective in reducing hospitalizations and deaths in those vaccinated. Infection rates do not risk a, a surge in hospitalizations, which will put unsuitable pressure on the NHS and uh, the assessment of risk not fundamentally changing by new variants of concern. So at each stage, the, the government will look at, at those four four key tests and, and if they're being met, they will continue with the, the, the stepped program. Next slide, please, Matthew. The step one, which we've sort of um, touched upon slightly already, uh, I guess, is that was on the 8th of March, which has happened. So the, the, the reopening of schools, the reopening um, of wraparound childcare uh, and one-to-one uh, -one exercise and recreation for household groups outdoors. Next slide. Uh, so step two, which is coming in as of Monday, so it will increase the you know, number of outdoor contacts to the rule of six or two households, um, no household mixing indoors. Outdoor sports and leisure will begin to be able to reopen and organised outdoor sport. Um, will continue to be minimised travelling and no holidays and outdoor parent and child groups up to 15. So that's coming in on the Monday and then the next big step and I guess is probably one of the ones which uh, which our businesses are going to be keen to, to look upon is, is uh, no earlier than the 12th of April and we're looking at indoor leisures uh, including gyms for use individually or within household groups, um, the continuation of the rule of six or two households outdoors, no indoor mixing, outdoor attractions, uh, libraries and community centres, personal care premises, all retail and outdoor hospitality. Uh, oh, yeah, obviously with our businesses, um, you no know, personal care, retail and outdoor hospitality, that may be a, 
a large number of the, the guests we've got on the webinar today. So we will be doing further specific um, webinars for personal care and, and uh, non-essential retail with our colleagues at Warwickshire County Council and also on outdoor hospitality, uh, a rugby uh, based webinar as well for, for those industries. Next slide, please, Becky. And then step two is that at least uh, five weeks after step one and no earlier. Sorry, that's the same slide. I'm oh, sorry, is that a continuation of the previous slide? My apologies. It was, but there's nothing for businesses on it. On it anyway, no, OK, so. sorry. <laughs> Over. No, that's fine. Step three, uh, so no earlier than 17th of May. Again, if we're, we're within the right place and the four tests are still being met. Indoor entertainment and attractions, indoor hospitality, again, which may have a, a big impact on, on some of our businesses. Uh, outdoor gatherings limited to 30 people. Indoor socialisation, again, limited. Uh, domestic overnight stays and organised adult sport. Indoor sport, sorry. And then step four, no early in the, um, July the 21st, uh, the government hopes to introduce following subject to review, uh, a, a lifting of, of restrictions, so no limits on social contact, nightclubs, larger events, and no legal limit on life events. So obviously those steps um, are set out by dates and we'll uh, rely on the, the, uh, the data and the tests being met. So whilst we hope that that will be as it goes, um, obviously we can't guarantee anything uh, at this stage. So just a couple of points really before we, we carry on is just some, some, some pointers of what you can do to prepare uh, whatever business you're in. Um, so first thing is to just revisit and review your risk assessment before reopening, considering the new variants, which may make transmission easier. Uh, appreciate some of the businesses on this webinar, you may have been shut for quite a long period of time. We went into lockdown, I guess, in the end of um, November or start of November, and, and some of us haven't come back out of that. Some of the businesses have never sort of reopened up until those those set dates in the roadmap. So it'd be worthwhile revisiting your risk assessments, making sure they're still relevant, making sure they're still fit for purpose. Now, the second thing is to make sure you're consulting with staff who may be coming back from to the workplace for the first time in many months ensure they're comfortable with what you're doing ensure they're aware of the risk assessments and how you're implementing controls within your business uh, just just a lot of this is going to be around planning planning how you're going to reopen how you're going to manage customers um, how you're going to implement your risk assessments and and, and and just consideration really of the sort of worst case scenario of what could go wrong and make sure you've got plans in place to stop that um, can, you could consider changing your method method of service delivery uh, using of outdoor spaces um, if you you know wanted to, to use the you know outdoor space outside your business if you considered using a pavement license and so that's something that you'd be able to use in your business um, there's lots of information on, on the Rugby Borough Council website about how to apply for a pavement license and, and how that may assist you in, in providing outdoor hospitality for instance next slide Andrew, just before I, I, I move it on, on the uh, the risk assessments, are there resources available to, to help businesses with, with that? Yes, there's some resources, I think, on our website, but also on the HSE website, so you can visit those uh, to obtain you know, how to carry out a COVID risk assessment along the lines of, of sort of how you, you would have done it. Most, most businesses, I should hope, would have done that in the, when they reopened the last time, so hopefully somebody should, you should all have a a COVID risk assessment of some kind, um, so it may be just a case of revisiting and reviewing that, um, but certainly, and if there, if there are any questions or need any help, then well, we can assist you with that. Uh, one of the things we're looking at, or would businesses should be looking at, is considering workplace testing for staff. Um, so as people will come back into to the workplace and would like to be into contact with more people regular more regular basis we're, we're asking businesses to ensure that staff are regularly tested utilizing our community testing centers and rapid uh, lateral flow testing uh, like Matthew sort of pointed out with, with the schools you know it does identify asymptomatic cases um, and, can, and may a prevent you know the spread of the, the of COVID but also may 
assist with your business because it, it may reduce the likelihood of a, an, out, a, an outbreak within your workplace if you can identify early um, those those that may be asymptomatic uh, and therefore may help with your big business continuity because you, you won't necessarily need to, to close your business. But the second part of that is if you do identify a positive case in your workforce or customers at your premises, um, you, you probably need to make sure you know what you're doing. And the best thing to do is to, to contact our Warwickshire Public Health team. And I've put the, the email address up on the, the slideshow, which hopefully will be emailed out to you. Um, and yeah, don't necessarily wait for National Test and Trace to contact you. Um, if you become aware of the cases related in business, it's, it's much better to start doing your own contact tracing. But as I say, any advice on that, please contact the Warwickshire Public Health team because they're happy to assist, um, but better to get on top of it uh, quickly and make sure you, you get all the, the controls in place. And the final bit, just to say from, from our point of view, is ask for advice. We're here to help. We want businesses to reopen. We want businesses to reopen successfully. Um, and we want everybody to, but we want everybody to start enjoying uh, going out to be in our town centres, to be in our businesses around the borough um, and to, to start, you know, getting sort of to some sort of sense of normality. We want to make sure that you're doing it safely and you're protecting yourselves as business owners, but also for your customers. Thank you. Henry, um you and I have been involved in the uh, in the electoral flow testing um, uh, programs and, and helping to set those up. But what's involved in that, and where can people get get a, a, a test locally, and, and you know, who's that available to? So currently, in in rugby, we have a, a community testing centre at Edward Street, the, uh, the Indian Community Centre. Uh, that the available currently, and we're targeting sort of workplaces. Uh, who, people who are having to go into the workplace. So obviously, as your businesses reopen, that will be be for you. The, the schools obviously are testing the, the school children, but for, from a business point of view, the, the best places to go is, is to the community testing centre. It's a fairly easy process. You can book online through the Eventbrite. Um, I, I myself go down there once a week because I'm, I'm in workplace and in contact with people that I wouldn't normally be in contact with. Um, and it's a 10 minute process and you get a text back after about half an hour to say whether you tested negative or positive and it it, it, it just helps to identify as i say for, for people within the, the business your your business your workforce if there's any asymptomatic cases yeah, so this is the uh, the center on the indian center on edward street isn't it right. and yes. um so the site has been set up really primarily for people who can't work at home um so it, you as business owners and employers can, can send your staff to get tested at, at that site um, if, if they're going to be meet, meeting people, which obviously most of them will. Um, so, uh, and Henry, anything else you wanted to, um, no. to add on this? Before we come to, to John, I noticed that, um, uh, that Ish Mystery's got his hand up and, and he's involved with the testing at, at that site. So I'll just bring him in now in case he's got anything to add on testing. Ish. So there we go. OK. Uh, well, there's some, some pointers there. Um, we'll come on to questions in a minute, but I just want to introduce now uh, John Bass from the Coventry and Warwickshire uh, Growth Hub. I'll stop sharing my screen so that you can get a, a nice look at him. Um, John, many of us don't really know much about the Coventry and Warwickshire Growth Hub. Um, could you give us a, just a bit of an overview of what the role of the hub and and how your organisation might be able to help the businesses on this call. OK, yes, my name is John Bass. Um, been at the Coventry and Warwickshire Growth Hub for five years now. I'm the account manager covering rugby. The Growth Hub was set up around about 2014 and it effectively replaced Business Link. Um, there are 38 Growth Hubs up and down the country. So the whole of England is covered by a growth hub. We're the local one. Uh, I actually live locally, which is quite handy. Um, and we are effectively a signposting organisation for businesses. So if as a business owner, you've got a, a question or a query 
or you're looking for a good source of funding, then your best bet is to get in touch with the Growth Hub. And I will put on the um, chat the uh, Growth Hub telephone number and the general email address so that if any of you do wish to take me up on the offer, then you can either ring or email the Growth Hub with your questions, queries or your um, yeah, um, request for support. Um, my background is that of uh, I spent 30 years working for NatWest and some of you will know me from my past life, then joined the Chamber of Commerce and eventually gravitated to the Growth Hub. So uh, I've been around a bit and um, if you wish to get in touch then please do. There's lots of grant funding out there um, and we are best placed to point you in the right direction. Um, not necessarily everybody will be eligible for it, but we can sort of point you in the best direction to get success. Thank you. Thank you for that, John. Um, I think at this point what I'll do is I'll, I'll um, introduce all of the, uh, the, the, the panellists that we have um, available to questions. So um, Paul Calver, uh, Warwickshire Police, uh, anything you want to, to briefly say? And I'm just, just good afternoon everybody and welcome to the webinar. It's really nice to see so many people here this afternoon. Uh, I work within um, Warwickshire Police within the COVID cell so been working very closely with Henry and other colleagues at Rugby um, Council for the last 12 months uh, here to sort of answer any questions that uh, I can help with. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Paul. Um, just before I move on, how, how have you found things from the, the police perspective in, in rugby and um, the support for businesses? Uh, anything particularly we, we need to note? Um, no, uh, to be honest, um, rugby has been um, not a problem town for us. Uh, it's probably the best way I can put it. We've had lots of challenges around COVID uh, around the county. Um, a lot of it is ha is about misunderstanding of regulations, and that has left you know has led to you know, calls to the police, etc., for certain things. But we do work very closely with um, with the council and our other colleagues within a partnership to try and address these issues and. And we very much follow what's called the four E's approach when we're looking at regulations. And that's about educating people, encouraging people to do the right thing, uh, engaging with them. And the very last one is about enforcement. And, and, and we are not a heavy enforcement force when it comes to um, COVID regulations. Uh, our statistics are released all the time around the country uh, with different police forces as such. And Warwickshire very much try and follow the first three E's when it comes to engagement with people. Um, as such so you know across the county we've tried to take that approach and with business communities I would say 99% of the business community around the whole of Warwickshire have listened have dealt with the regulations correctly and they've done their best and it's been a real challenge for them just as much as ourselves and our council colleagues. So uh, thank you very much Paul. Um, at this point I should just raise for for wider awareness in case people haven't seen in 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 the chat sarah simpson has questioned and henry has clarified that the the rule of six comes in on the uh the 29th not on the uh the 12th of april so apologies for that error with that um i, th I think that was a copy and paste across slides error so it, it appeared on both it shouldn't have appeared on the 12th it, should have been on the 29th. So thank you for raising that, Sarah and Henry. Thank you for clarifying. Um, can I just introduce, um, I've got uh, Bogdan and Simeon joining us from uh, Warwickshire County Council. Um, don't know if either of you wanted to um, to say anything at this point. Yeah. Matthew, yeah, sure. Um, hi guys, I'm Sim Lee. I work in the um, Economy and Skills team at Warwickshire County Council. So. Um, I look after a couple of the uh, grant programmes that we deliver. So we've got a capital based grant and more recently we've got the Adapt and Diversify grant, which is probably on your guys' radar. Um, we work quite closely with uh, John Bass and the guys at Borough Council as well. Um, they quite often refer people over towards me and we engage with businesses and refer them 
elsewhere as well. So yeah, if anyone's got any questions on those grants that I mentioned, then yeah, feel free to pop a question in the chat. Uh, and we've, thank you, Sim. We've got uh, David yep. Moore and Abby McCartney. Uh, to, sorry, was that Bogdan wanted to come in? Or to, yeah, I just wanted to, to present myself. Um, I'm Bogdan and I'm the Business Crime Advisor, uh, part of um, Wiltshire County Council Community Safety. Uh, and my role is to kind of carry out crime prevention projects um, across the county to kind of help and support businesses protect themselves from crime. Um, and one of the things um, we're working on is um, the Business Watch website as well, with ha which has a lot of uh, crime prevention inf information um, and COVID-19 updates as well, um, from each, which including um, a business security and management checklist as well, that might come um, helpful for some businesses. Thank you. And Thank you. Uh, I think you're sat in my chair. Um, great if you could please vacate it. Um, uh, so I've got David Moore, Abby McCartney from the economic growth team at the Borough Council. Hello, David and Abby. Hi. Just to um, if I could just say a few words. Thank you, everyone, for joining today and um, good to be here. Um, so I, I lead the economic development team at Abby is um in my team she'll just say hello in a moment but um uh, essentially uh, we're here to support businesses work closely with john bass at uh, the growth hub but um i'm currently administrating the um additional restrictions grant scheme which um, um, no doubt many of you have applied for um but i work also with a colleague uh, by the name of chris but at who um, is also managing grants um, at the council. She's not able to make it today, but happy to answer any questions if I can later on. Thank you. Thank you, David. Abby, do you want to add anything? Thanks, David. Yeah, I'm Abby McCartney, Place Marketing Officer at Rugby Borough Council. I can share our help for you, help for your business email address in the chat, so any general inquiries you can always email email into us we'll do our best to help you through that as well thank you abby and then finally joining our panel is uh john mcturney uh licensing officer of, of, of the borough council uh john you, you wanna... yes good afternoon all um as matthew said i'm john mcturney licensing officer of rugby borough council uh, we're a regulatory service. We work closely with Paul Calver at the police and Henry Biddington in environmental protection. Um, just to echo really what Paul said earlier, you know, compliance has been fairly good across the borough in between the reopenings and that. Um, it's good to see so many of you on this chat. I uh, recognise a few holders, uh, premises licence holders there. If there are any queries or anything, obviously the government are constantly changing the way in which we're approaching this. Uh, we try our best. I, I'll drop our team email in the in the chat. So any queries, we'll try and get back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. OK, so um, what, what we'll do, if, if anyone wants to to, to drop a, a question into the chat, then that's fine. But for this point also, if you want to use the raise hand, please do. It, in the meantime, um, I've got a fairly specific question to come in, uh, Sim, for, for you. I mean, the, the detail you'll need to pick up with, with the questioner, as, as you've said in your reply. But just on that uh, Diversify grant, um, what, what was the process for, for letting people know uh, whether or not um, they were successful there? Have you, have you contacted people? Should, yeah. should the successful applicants know by now? That's what I'm asking. Yeah, we are. In the last couple of days, we managed to finalise all of the um, applications. So if people haven't heard now, they should hear probably within the next 24 hours. And just to give some context, we had um, there was £1 million for the first round and it opened up on the Monday. And by 6 p.m. on the first day, there was, I think, £1.8 million worth of requests. So the interest was massive, so we had to close it off. Um, they've now been assessed. We've got 500,000 ring fence for round two, plus whatever's left over from the assessments on round one. So there will be a second round coming. So people that either missed it, um, were rejected, or you know just uh, weren't aware of it, I can, I can send the link and we'll be given a date in the next couple of weeks on round two. 
Um, but just a tip for anyone that is looking to apply again or, or apply for the first time, the biggest thing that people were rejected because of was the supporting information. So we did ask for things like a forecast and business plan and, and quotes for items they were purchasing. Um, and some of them you could kind of you could see that there was maybe a project there, but without the information provided, we we with the amount of interest there was, we just couldn't accept the application. So on the required information, if you just put in as much information as you can, um, just tell the story of your business, how you, how you've been affected, and you know what you're now doing to help diversify the business or adapt in different ways. It could be anything from you know, a pub that's looking to develop their outside area for extra people, or, you know, we've helped retailers that had never sold online that are looking to, you know, develop an online presence and create an e-commerce system. So they're the types of things that we're really looking for. And it's it's kind of a, there's been a lot of the COVID support in terms of cash grants for cash flow, but these, the Adapt and Diversify grant is really around, you know, it's more around business development and for a specific project. So. You know, if, if anyone's got any questions, I'll drop the um, our business email in the chat as well for, for specific questions. And anyone that's got any specific questions about their case as well, uh, let me know and I can always get in touch. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have a new date soon for round two. Thank you, Sim. Uh, of course, if there's any general questions, we can we can deal with those, yeah, yeah. those now. Um, just a point uh, on on grants, uh, I suppose the good news is for the restart grants that will shortly be be available. Um, so unfortunately, the uh, the manager who who oversees this for council wasn't free this afternoon, but we we did catch up a little bit earlier. Uh, so the restart grants, we're hoping to pay automatically without the need for for an application at all. Um, and many of you on the call will be eligible for these, and these are up to eighteen thousand pounds. Um, don't get too excited, you know, that's that's the top level. I'm not that obviously saying that everyone's going to, going to get that. There are the criteria on the, the government website if you want to see what you might get. We've not put information about this out yet because we're waiting for the, the guidance. What, what we've been told is that we're not expected to make payments before the 1st of April. Well, that, that's good because we don't know what the criteria, the full criteria are yet. Or the mechanism that we're being asked to use. Um, but we are already starting work on this where we do know um, criteria to classify your business uh, into the correct category so that we can make payment quicker at the right time. So um, do look out for details of that. Um, these will go to businesses that were required to close and, and already had um, payments for, for other grants. So that's a little bit of good news coming coming your way if you qualified for those. Uh, and then the uh, local restriction support grant um, is also um, coming, isn't it? Uh, I think David Moore might be able to help us a bit more on this one. Um, well, the re local restrictions grant the four thousand to nine thousand has already been paid to businesses. So that that came out, I think it was in February. Um, so if you if if you feel you're eligible and you're not, um, you 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 you've not received that. I mean, please get in touch with us. Um, but as I, as um, Matthew said, the LRSG and the restart to come are managed by our colleague that isn't on the call. But we, I believe, we have paid a range of those grants already to businesses that are eligible. And if you feel, um, I think it was from Richard, was it? If you feel that you um, you're due that and haven't received it or um, need more information, please do get in touch uh, with us and. Um, uh, we can we can come back to you on that inquiry, can we not, Matthew, from from the uh, from his login? From uh, login. Absolutely can. Yeah, that, that, that's fine. We can do that. So I, yeah, I, I'm aware that there was uh, another one that came in a couple of weeks ago that is in process of being dealt with. As, as David said, it, um, if you haven't had it yet, you should soon. But do contact us if you think yeah. that, that it's been delayed for any reason. Uh, so that's some good news on 
on um, on that. So yeah, that's absolutely right, uh, Richard. If if you if you already got one and you qualify, we're not asking you to apply again. We're trying to make it as easy as we can. That's for the additional restrictions grants. That's for the restart grants. Anything where we already have enough information to know you qualify and are entitled to it, we will just pay. Um, and so, you know, if you've had one already, that that should be um, sufficient. Um, so, a um, question from uh, Gemma, this is all very well if you have a business premises, um, but if you don't, there's, there's not so much available. Can, um, I, can I answer this one, Matt? Yeah, great. So, you, that David. was, this is really the domain of the additional restrictions grant or the ARG grant as we've called it. Um, so, that is that applications are still live for that on our website um, and I can put the URL in for that if you've not claimed if you're a business that it's really aimed at those businesses that were not forced to close and suffered and yet suffered a severe reduction in income during lockdown periods and so if you're one of those businesses you don't need business premises but uh, you just need to demonstrate that um, that drop in income um, and um, a few other things, but I can include that um, link, that web page link, so that you can check your eligibility and apply for that grant. It's still live at the moment. Thank you for that, David. Uh, John, um, John Bass, is there anything else that's available for, for businesses that don't have premises and that perhaps struggling with with turnover and, and and need cash in realistically grant funding is um usually restricted to the purchase of capital items um unless it's for innovation or something to do with green business low carbon those sort of applications but um no grant funding as far as COVID recovery is concerned, lies mainly with the local authorities. And um, yeah, so it's either Rugby Borough Council or Warwickshire County Council for their schemes that are all sort of available through um, the websites and .gov.uk. But uh, unfortunately, we haven't got access to any other sort of funding that is related to business recovery and COVID. Can I can I just add, John, that um, for those that haven't considered it yet, there are um, loans available for business, COVID loans available for business, both bounce back loans and um, and the COVID COVID business interruption loan, C bill loan, and um, again we can refer. Um, uh, guests through to that uh, grant. That's that's administered by um, the Coventry and Warwickshire Reinvestment Trust, which we can uh, provide the link to. That's great. Thank you for that extra information. So um, but there's a little bit of good news in there from John if you're looking to innovate rather than just needing support. So uh, there, there may be um, support for for capital or, or innovation or for, for green business funding there if if that is part of what you're doing. Um, so I've got a a uh, question about the sort of lateral flow and 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 PCR. Uh, this is this is more my cup of tea. This is, this is something I know a little bit more about and, and can help with. Um, so uh, the, the the point is made about the promotion of the lateral flow test center at the Indian Center on Edward Street um, and this is a, a fair point it's not been promoted that widely by the borough council because of um, problems with the data around um, um, uh, the effectiveness of, of, of not not the test, so that would be wrong, but the effectiveness of whether we were reaching the right people. So what we wanted to do is make sure that that we were linking our promotion with attendance and able to to, to monitor who was attending that way. Um, the need to do that has changed. So yes, absolutely, we can start ramping up and promote that a little bit more. 
the point about booking, it is true that you don't have to book to turn up, but it really, really helps us if you do. So we're, we're not going to be pushing the fact that, that you don't need a booking because we really want people to book. If people book, we get a little bit more information about about uh, why they're attending and what business sector they're in, and that really helps us. So uh, please, please do book um, if you attend. Um, if you are visiting on the spur of a moment, don't worry about it, just attend. Um, the PCR site at Railway Terrace is staying. We're extending the license for the Department of Health to stay on that site until at least September. Um, so um, as far as we are aware, it's still staying. It's going to be used for different things. So PCR tests in the mornings and then in the afternoons, a pickup point for natural flow tests for um, families with school aged children. But that's still going to be there. Um, so please uh, do use that lateral flow test site for your staff. Um, uh, there we go, someone saying that they were directed to go and pick some up and take them home. Well, that there's a result. Um, not sure what. So the um, the ones to do at home are meant to be for uh, families of school age children. Um, so as businesses would ask you not to use those, please, because um, supplies at the moment are limited. Um, we're hoping that supply problems will, will ease and they'll be more generally available to pick up by anybody uh, for any reason. But at the moment, um, it's to, to keep the schools, uh, children and families tested. Um, so the test site of the Indian Centre is for your use. Um, OK, so we've covered various different uh, business um, grants and funding. And we've talked about testing. Not had any questions about uh, use of outdoor space or pavement licensing, John, but it, it does remain an, an option. Uh, what kinds of things would businesses need to, to consider if they wanted to to trade, um, uh, you know, serve alcohol outdoors in order to to open a little bit earlier? This is John McTernan. Yes, sorry. It's like um, panics look on <laughs> So, um, part of the the reopening is is to do with the Business and Planning Act. Um, as that has come in, it's to help ease um, ease the, the the pressure on 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 premises as such. Um, it allows sort of outdoor space to be used within within the premises within within the boundaries of the premises, which may not have been used in the past. So restrictions have been eased in that sense. In terms of pavement licences, um, you can now apply to Rugby Borough Council for a pavement licence, which is the fee of £60. It goes to consultation, which is a five day consultation. It goes to all the relevant authorities, such as the police, uh, Warwick Highways, Fire Service, and they determine the application. Part of the application is a plan you have to submit. The plan needs to show the social distance in between the tables, we look for at least the two metres, if not one in exceptional circumstances. Um, if you want any more information on it, I'm happy to discuss with people. And if they drop me an email, um, I can go through it with them before they submit if they've got any concerns and such. But it's basically it's allowing businesses with potentially that didn't in the past use their, their outdoor space or, or couldn't use their outdoor space. Is it's, it's allowing them when the when the reopen occurs to to increase their their margins as such. Thank you for that, John. And that would apply to a business wanting to open regardless of whether or not it needed a pavement license and if they had their own outdoor space and some of those points would apply, wouldn't yeah. they? Yes. So, uh, Paul, uh, Warwickshire Police, do you want to come yeah, in at this just, point? Yeah, just on that point that John obviously made about table license, obviously I assess them on behalf of Warwickshire Police. And one of the common issues that we see when we see the applications, which I'm sure John will agree with, is when people are submitting plans for their um, table licences, please make them as detailed as possible to show that social distancing, but also to show, you know, the distance between the tables and the road, etc, because there are sort of minimum distances we have to adhere to with that. 
but a lot of the work that goes back to the applicant is because the plans aren't suitable to be able to assess that social distancing, whatever it may be at the time when the application comes in on the guidance. So just a, just a plea to everybody who does put one in though, those plans are really cru crucial because that's what we look at as well um, when assessing the application. That's a good point. Thank you, Paul. Henry, did you want to add anything to this? Yeah, just quickly, I think you touched on it, Matthew, about the use of outdoor spaces, which may not be pavement. So things like car parks or additional garden spaces where you may want to put tables and chairs. Just if you're looking at putting structures up to, to shelter your, your outdoor hospitality, just bear in mind that it would need to be considered outdoor. So it still have to be 50 percent open to the elements. So if you put something like a marquee or up, then it would need to have two of the sides adjacent sides open rather than than closed because otherwise it'll make it an indoor structure and we'd call it indoor hospitality so if you want any further advice again ask us um and we will, can advise on outdoor structures in, in in car parks or beer gardens and things like that uh, and then i think just to mention that ryan from rugby first has, has talked about packs i don't know if you were going to come in on that matthew you're on mute oh. I am. Thank you. Thank you for that, Henry. Very remiss of me. I meant to bring Ryan in earlier. Ryan first. Uh, sorry, Ryan Webster from Rugby First. Um, also available to, to deal with questions and I forgot to introduce him. So let me do that, that now. Ryan, is there anything you wanted to, to add? And you might also want to make your point about the packs um, that you made available as well. Hi, uh, Matthew. Thank you for forgetting about me. You know, I'm always left in the background. Uh, no, it's fine. Yeah, so obviously we, we have got some packs that have been put together uh, that include uh, material for businesses to help them reopen safely. Um, questions about, um, uh, about you know, the um, uh, contact information for people, um, window stickers, floor graphics, uh, hand sanitizers, disclaimers, uh, anything that we can help with. Um, so yeah, so primarily they are going to be for uh, businesses within the town centre and the bid levy area but obviously we want rugby to open safely as much as everybody else so if there is businesses outside outside of the town centre uh, that want these packs then obviously if they get in touch then we can uh, we can help them out as well but um, initially we are aiming towards our bid levy payers but like I say um, you know if there's businesses outside of the levy area in the town centre then we can get that sorted as well. Well, that's a very kind offer, Ryan. Thank, thank you very much for for that. I mean, things like the sanitizer packs, um, we're not going to be able to help with, but things like uh, posters and things like that, we 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 can also make available for people to um, to download and and print themselves. But there's an offer there um, just to answer you, your question, Councillor Lawrence, um, for for organisations outside of the bid area too. So, uh, Henry, I think this is one for you. Um, we've got a, and uh, just to let Annie know, see no question, I'll come back to that if that's okay. But, uh, Henry, um, track and trace, um, is that still a thing? And, and the, the uh, track and trace app um, and checking in for hospitality venues, what, where, do, where do businesses stand in, in regard to to keeping details of, of people who visit their yes. premises? Yeah, so there will still be a requirement to have the testing or track and trace app uh, up and for, for customers to utilise that. Uh, there was a, a slight change in some of the regulations which we're still going through, which was only released uh, yesterday, so apologies, I haven't quite got to the bottom of it, but there is looking at changes of, of whether it's just one member of a group um, coming in and, 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 and clicking in on that test and trace or whether it's each person who attends the premises. Um, and it, if, you, if people don't have the app, it will still be a requirement for the business to take down details of those people and keep those details for 21 days as per was the case um, prior to, to lockdowns. Um, so yes, that will still be a thing for hospitality to be doing. That's great. Thank you. I think a few of us are going to have to re-download the app. Um, Paul, you want to come back in? Yeah, sorry. Just it's basically there wasn't a question in chat, so I thought I'd raise this question myself and, po and pose it to Henry. So apologies, Henry. Um, but obviously, during the, the last uh, few months, 
a lot of the regulators have done a lot of work around supermarkets and places like that, the essential retail that's been open. And obviously there's been some common issues that have arisen from that that Henry might want to sort of address with this group, because obviously when they open for retail and things like that coming in the future, there might be things that they can plan for. I'm thinking, Henry, of the things yeah. against uh, regarding face masks, v shields um, and queuing systems and things like that that you've come across in the sort of supermarkets and the project there. And apologies for throwing that one at you. No, thank you, Paul. It's a very good point. So, yeah, I think um, there has been a lot of work with the businesses that have been currently open. Um, and, and yeah, there is some common common sort of pointers that, that we come across. So so a lot of these is is making sure that you've got the right number of customers in your premises. So plan for how many people actually can can fit into your premises safely. Uh, staff will need to wear face coverings if they are in um, public uh, places where the staff, where the public are attending. Uh, and the public will be required to wear a face mask unless they've got an exemption. So that again, putting things up like signage to say in face masks will re be required um, is a good idea. That's the kind of things we've been, been pointing out. Um, providing customers with sanitizer, so sanitizer stations at the entrance to, to your premises is, is also a good idea. And all of these things hopefully will be part of your, your risk assessments. Um, as you as you come to reopen, um, but these are the sort of common things that we've been picking up on in in the project work. But well, as as premises do reopen, we will be coming out and doing similar sort of project work as sectors reopen, uh, and then obviously with the, the close contact services, um, the you know the, their their requirements are slightly different. So they're they're requested that they wear face coverings and visors when they're carrying out any close contact work. So. Uh, your beauticians or your barbers or your, your hairdressers, uh, nail technicians. Paul, you might want to add something on that. Have you got yeah, any? sorry, yeah, just, just to come back on that, a, a common call that we get uh, to the police is around face coverings. Uh, and one of the, the, the most common is about staff not wearing face coverings. And when we attend those type of incidents, we establish that staff, may, some staff are exempt for medical reasons. Now, obviously, you can get the, the green lanyards, uh, that people wear to show they're exempt from face coverings. So if you have any members of staff that are exempt from wearing face coverings, please encourage them to wear the green lanyards as it stops calls coming in to the police, to the regulated services as such, so alleging that staff are breaching regulations. So it stops one of us turning up at your door uh, as well. So it stops that, you know, that embarrassment and everything else, especially for the member of staff the potential is medically exempt. They don't want to keep having to tell all the regulated services, oh, I, don't, I can't wear it because of this, that and the other. So please do encourage them to wear those lanyards. And I'm sure Matthew or Henry will be able to tell you where you, you get them from. But um, I would just ask that because that does pre prevent a lot of, sort of reports and issues for your staff and your company. I'll be honest, I think you're the last person I'd want coming on my door, Paul. So... Uh... <laughs> Uh, Henry, where are you going to come in on where those are available from? I, I think uh, Sainsbury's have them, but uh, Henry, do you, do we, is that what you're going to come in on? You're, you're muted. I think they're available various places for the, the, the exemption lanyards. I was just going to come back to Rachel because I think she's put a follow up question on the, the test and trace issue, if, if, you, if that's OK. Well, yeah, I'm please gonna... do. I was going to come to uh, her. Thank you. So, hi, Rachel. Uh, yeah, so it is something, I guess, as people are I, I sort of as you're doing what you were doing before, so seating people at tables, we would be expecting you to ask if people are, are using the app to sign in. And if they're not using the app, then you'd be taking their customer details. So yes, to, to a certain extent, it is something that you would be expected to monitor uh, and, and request customers to do. I hope that answers that question. Thank you for that. Um, so a bit, before uh, the chain of, of questions moves too far down for me to, to, to catch up, I just want to go back to Annie's question. I was holding it just because we're, the conversation had moved on, but we'll, we'll, we'll deal with this and then come back to the um, to the to the retail questions if, if we need to. So, uh, Sim, um, I've been taking the, uh, the the general nature of the, the question rather than the specifics. The adapt on diversify grant. Um, what are the reasons for for why particular types of businesses were, were eligible for that and, and others were excluded? Just taking the point that some businesses had to close and others didn't. 
Yeah, so when the grant was put together, we had to um, kind of bring up a list of the, the sectors that we thought were most affected. So, um, so those were the ones in the retail and hospitality and leisure. Um, and also there were certain certain sectors identified within their supply chain. So when you look at the, the SIP code list, there are some things that you might look at and think that is strange, but they are linked to the supply chain of retail, hospitality and leisure. Now, photography has actually come up a couple of times and what I'm actually doing is I'm, I'm kind of building a list of SIP codes that have been excluded, not because we said we don't want to support photography, but because they weren't identified that first time round. So um, thanks for flagging it, actually, because there's been three or four people I've spoken to in that situation, and especially those in the kind of wedding supply chain, wedding photographers, videographers, that kind of thing. Um, we're, I'm building a case to kind of get them included in the second round. So we've got, it was put together by our economist team who kind of see things in in kind of black and white, but with our input and from your guys flagging it as well, we can hopefully build that, build the SIP code list in a bit more of a real world way. So yeah, I'll um I'll put it I'll put it forward for you. Don't worry. Okay, thank you for that, Simon. Potentially some good news there, Annie. Um, we'll we'll wait and see. Um, so uh, we've got a, a, a question here. I've think it's probably going to be for, for Henry to answer, but I'm afraid I don't understand the, the question because I don't know what an OOS group is. Um, this is to do with uh, children over the age of 11 needing to wear a mask in a, in a communal space. Now, as far as I'm aware, it's recommended but not required. But, but Henry, you might know more than I do on this. Uh, an out of school setting. There we go. That's, that's what it is. Um. I'd have to go back and check the regulations. I don't know off the top of my head, so I'm not going to give you an answer. I all might know the full answer to that one. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's children at 11, so things like retail, it would be expected that they should be wearing a face covering. So I don't think it's any different to that. Paul. I'm just mostly looking through the regulations. I will come back to you. Thank you, Paul. OK, so the answer to that one is, is none of us really know, but uh, but we can find out. Um, thank you, thank you for that. So, is there um, anything that uh, some of the close contact services can be doing to to prepare for, for opening hairdressers, beauticians, um, anything beyond what we've covered already? Um, just just trying to think of of sectors that that um, are quite important, but we've not spoken so much about just yet. Henry. So again, I think. With the you know with the close contact services we need to sort of look at the the steps so personal care is looking at on the 12th of april under uh, under step two um but there will be some restrictions on that so which you may need to be sort of prepared to to look at um in relation to um ha how many people you'll be able to have on your premises how many people will be able to do treatments um there will be a further webinar again regarding close contact services um which will be coming out via uh, my colleagues at the, 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 the county council. But there is there is specific guidance. And as, as I've said, and always I've been mentioned in the, the chat is that you know, there will be an there is an expectation that anyone carrying out closed contact services wear face masks and visors, uh, people within those premises or face coverings, sorry, face coverings and visors, anybody in the uh, the, the, the customers are also expected to wear face coverings unless they're having specific work done. Um, face Facial work, obviously, you can't trim a beard if you've got a face covering on. Um, but there is, so yeah, I think there will be further guidance coming out regarding that um, and, and further webinars in relation specifically to those sectors. So that, that guidance that's, that's coming, um, will that help um, businesses to know how many people they can safely have within their premises or, or is there a, 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 a guide to follow on that or is it just a case of do your own risk assessment and bearing in mind of the two meter distancing? Yeah, most of that will be based on the previous, previous risk assessment um, which they would have put in place but obviously bearing in mind the new variants so it would still be in the two meters spacing. Um, I think there'll be specific guidance coming out on what 
when when the regulations come out what what can and can't happen at step two with with close contact services uh, but we're actually sort of waiting that guidance as such but we will we'll be able to keep you updated and if anybody who works within the close contact services wants further advice or we can give that advice out once we, we get the information then please do get in contact with us so i think uh, for, for these services you know, there's going to be a large demand at the first opportunity isn't there it's not, not all of us can do the clipper cut clipper lockdown cut like like i have and that's going to be a, a big rush and that i suppose is something to feature in the um in the risk assessment how do we deal with the the extra demand all at one time at the beginning just to, to spread people out and keep them apart but um there we go we've got more more guidance coming and a specialist webinar in the planning for that so watch out for that so we we did have a a, a question earlier asking you know all these useful links um can we make them available i think what it would be sensible for me to do um would be to go back through the chat everything that was asked and, and answered in the chat any links email addresses uh I'll, I'll make a note of all of those and then use the eventbrite uh system to to email everyone on the, the call um that we've with those details so that so we've got them um now we haven't had any more sorry Matt, sorry paul yes can i just come back face covering one i've just had a look at the regulations that we had updated police wise um in march so it's not the the very latest ones that released but i can't see it would have changed and for face covering it's um children under the age of 11 are exempt so one would assume that 11 and above are under the same regulations for face coverings as everybody else in the specific areas that you are required to wear face coverings is the way I would suggest it. OK, thank you very much for that, Paul. Um, so we've not had any, um, any any more questions come in, so it's a kind of a, a final call. If So if anyone is um, on the call and has a burning question but isn't able to use the chat, now's the time raise your hand or, or or unmute yourself and say so in the next few seconds um, so we can we can take your question so uh, I've got a question from I've not seen what that question is Richard so why don't you share it with us OK, uh, this is to do with how many people are allowed in the store. Um, so, Henry, I think this is down to an individual business risk assessment, isn't it? Or yeah, so what, what we, we're looking at with, um, so it is down to your risk assessment. Um, but basically what you need to do is sort of a, a calculator of your floor space, I guess. So if you look at how much floor space you've got and how many you know, square meters you've got, and then you try and look, fit how many people you can fit within sort of two square meters of that premise if, it, if that makes sense that's a rough calculator of, of, of how to do it um and it's just sort of if you look in the store and you, can, you think you can, people can socially distance think about your pinch points so where people might not be able to, to squeeze past so you know that would need to be a one-way system how you system it out so if you've got a large larger store obviously you can fit that makes sense obviously you can fit more people in but yeah, it's really about looking at your floor space and, and the square meterages and how many sort how you think you can socially distance everybody in that store by by sort of two meters um and then 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 work it on that basis um there isn't a hard and fast rule on that uh but obviously again it, it's managing those people going into that store uh um to make sure they, they can do that but that would all be part of your 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 risk assessment uh paul probably wants to come in on there yeah, sorry, yeah, just, just to back up what Henry's saying there, really, one of the main complaints we've had about stores um, during lockdown is numbers with inside members of the public calling us to state that, you know, a place premises is over numbers, it's not safe, etc. Um, so we do get calls about that. And one of the pinch points that people do highlight to us when they're reporting is, is around till. So if you have more than one till, how far apart are they? with people queuing, because that's one regular complaint we get, but also when people are having to queue down aisles and then other people are having to try and get past them to get down the aisles for other things, there's another complaint. So they're just sort of the pinch points, you know, that Henry's mentioned that just to look at very carefully, because those are the areas that we do get reports of. You know, as police, we get reports about everything to do with COVID and surprisingly, but that is one of the main things within shops that people ring the police about. 
Thank you, Lerat. Um, I suppose one of the things also to take into account is that um, this time, 12 months ago, when we went into the first lockdown, my, my local co-op had a sign on the door. They'd done their risk assessment and said no more than 10 in the store at once, which was great. But the problem is you didn't you know how many were in the store until you went in. So you also have to think about how you monitor how many people come in uh, and out of the store as well. So thank you for your patience on that, Dave and, and Helen, and sorry for missing your, your question when you when you first raised it. Um, so that, that really is the final call, I, I think. Um, just a, a moment for, for anyone else who I, I may have missed. Thank you, panellists, for, for answering those points. Thank you, uh, businesses, again, uh, for all you have done so far, um, supporting our communities, um, working with us as regulators and as advisors and grant administrators. Um, we've, we've done our best to support you. and I, I, I hope that these sessions are, are useful to you. Um, and do let us know if there's any themes or additional sessions that, that you think would be of, of benefit. Um, very best of wishes from all of us for, for reopening. Um, and let's just hope that, uh, that the roadmap continues um, as the trajectory looks like it is going to be. Um, so thank you all, appreciate your time, um, and uh, maybe we'll do this again soon. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.